So uh, just very briefly to talk about um, Professor Steele's uh, works. Um, so he, uh, Professor Steele is also uh, not only teach at Brooklyn College, but it's also uh, he also teach at the Uni, uh, CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, he is the author of two books, uh, How to Make a Human, Animals and Violence in the Middle, Middle Ages. And the other one, How Not to Make a Human, Pets, Feral Children, Worms, Sky Bureau, Oysters. That sounds really interesting. Um, so now he's actually working on his third one and he also has many articles. Um, and his third book project is called Irrational, the, the Irrational Animal on the Limits of Humanity and Freedom in the Middle Ages. So let me, uh, without further ado, turn it over to Professor Steele and please take it over. Okay, so I will uh, share my screen. <clears throat> and what I have here today is something I've never tried before, which I'm sure but many of you, this is old hat, which is uh, not speaking from a script, I just have the PowerPoint. So this is gonna be kind of midway between uh, kind of a classroom lecture and an academic talk, sort of a, a hybrid, hybrid animal, if you will. Um, okay, so what I have here on the first slide is an image from a missionary document, uh, Ulrich of Portanane, who traveled into Central Asia in the 13th century and made a record of what it was that he encountered there and what it was that he thought he would encounter there, including um, the Sinocephaly, the so-called dog-headed people represented here speaking to each other, having a conversation, whether they're speaking in barks or in language is a little bit unclear, but this is something that people believed in. And I will say a little bit more about that later on when I talk about the Sinocephaly in more detail. But I offer this image up to you both as representative medieval image and also to stress the kind of particular uh, expertise and limitations of what it is I'm doing. So uh, I'm a medievalist. I am uh, trained as a medieval literary scholar of a degree in English and comparative literature. Um, and I focus primarily on the literatures of what's loosely called Western Europe, uh, with a focus on Middle English literature, but I also read material in Old French and in Latin. Um, so <clears throat> like all of us, there's something that I, I know deeply, but there's also a, a great deal of material that I don't know well. Um, so I'm not a sinologist. Uh, I don't know the languages uh, of, of that area, uh, and I don't know the culture very deeply, except as, as a modern person. So I'm looking forward to the conversation afterwards uh, for some comparative examples and maybe uh, course corrections from many colleagues who are here who are joining us from all over the world, uh, as we've heard from Paris, from India, from Taiwan, and so on. So the talk that I'm giving today is called What is Post-Humanism or the Pre-Modern Challenge to Humanisms, Technological or Otherwise? One of my goals here is to offer uh, what pre-modern thinking can do to help us shake up sedimented notions of the human and to challenge um, the difference, uh, basically challenge the kind of cliches of transhumanism. So let me talk about transhumanism first. Um, I have a representative book here. If you want to know more about the field in a very handy, efficient way, Adam Kirsch's The Revolt Against Humanity, Imagining a Future Without Us is quite handy. It's uh, very, very useful, it's very short. Uh, the field of transhumanism, so far as I know it, and it's something that in a way I've sort of avoided because I find it kind of embarrassing, is a field of technological enhancement of human capacities as human capacities are typically understood. So the aims of transhumanism is to, ex one of the key aims is to extend life, to eliminate death, essentially, um, to ensure that our genes and our cells and so forth can be repaired in perpetuity. Uh, it also aims at sensory enhancement through technological upgrades. So for example, a bio, uh, bionic eye that is able to see all color spectrums, for example. Um, these things sound like science fiction, and indeed they are science fiction, but we have been making technological advances in a number of fields, and perhaps 
some decades or some centuries, hence some of these things will be realized. They also aim at bodily perfection, basically the body without body problems. So if you think about that, if the key features of the body is that it, it dies, and that it has a limited sensory apparatus, well, transhumanism is aiming to undo both of those particular problems. So one of the key figures in transhumanism is a man named Zoltan Istvan, uh, and in his very widely read book, surprisingly widely read book called The Transhumanist Wager, uh, this became so popular that in fact he decided to run for president of the United States on the transhumanist ticket, knowing like a lot of fringe candidates that he was not going to win the presidency, but he wanted to promote his ideas. Um, and he was asked by the Florida humor columnist, a man named Dave Barry, during an interview, Dave Barry decided to ask him a question that he thought was funny. He decided to ask Sultan Istvan what his opinions were about low flow toilets. And Istvan gave actually a very serious answer that I think represents transhumanism and its interests very well. We think pooping and peeing is a waste of time is literally what he said. Basically, what is the body without the problems of the body? This is what transhumanism aims at. And it seems like this is something, a fantasy that's realizable and expressible only under our current technological era but I'm going to challenge that over the course of my talk and show how some of these transhumanist fantasies are already embedded in some of the medieval thinking that I know well. So I also want to stress that one of the issues I think with transhumanism apart from its kind of historical shallowness is that insofar as I know the field, it often doesn't think deeply around some of its key concepts really about humanity, even though transhumanism is challenging sedimented notions of humanity, it's, it seems to replicate or perpetrate uh, or perpetuate, I guess, these notions of humanity that we often encounter um, in a kind of cliched way. So I offer here, I'm not gonna read this whole thing. It's uh, something called the Transhumanist Declaration. This uh, was published in the late 90s. It's a pamphlet that lays out the basic features of transhumanism, again, this technological enhancement to, to humanity. Um, and I've highlighted some key terms that I think are problems, things that ought to be thought about in more detail. But in a larger sense, if we're talking about technological enhancement, of course, the fundamental question under capitalism is who owns and licenses the technology. Um, those of us who are Twitter users, as I am, uh, and I've been on it for about a decade now, and I've built communities there, and I have conversations, have watched in some horror and some amusement as Elon Musk has taken over this social media service and is, in the process, destroying it. Uh, it's becoming less and less amusing, less and less fun, and it gives me a sense of what it might be like to uh, technologically upgrade myself with something. Say if I were to get a bionic eye that allowed me to see all the spectrums, the question is who would own the software upgrades? Would I be able to do that myself or would I have to pay for it? And if I didn't pay my license, would I go blind and so on? These seem to be some fundamental political questions that a lot of transhumanist thinking doesn't deal with. It says at the bottom, transhumanism does not support any particular party, politician, or political platform. That seems naive to me. Um, I'm also very struck by this phrase, we seek personal growth beyond our current biological limitations there in, in number four. I'm wondering what they mean by the person, how they distinguish one person from another, what they mean by growth. This seems to be a cliche. It's a, it's a metaphor that they don't seem to have considered. Um, they also use this phrase rational debate in number six, we need to create forums or should be fora, where people can rationally debate what needs to be done. Um, and I'm wondering what counts as rational debate, what can be recognized as rational, who are the people who are involved in this debate, what is the venue, what is who has the power to make decisions. Again, this seems extremely abstract and ill-considered. And what's striking to me is that there doesn't seem to be any attempt to rethink this problem of reason, which is something I'll be talking about throughout this talk. Uh, issues of well-being as well. Uh, what counts as well-being? Why is that a value? What does well-being look like when we're talking about te technological upgrades? This notion that 
humanity will be radically changed by technologically in the future without a sense that it has already happened, that the human what is a technological animal, that the very existence of us as humans, uh, as agricultural, uh, an agricultural species, as a species that domesticates other animals, that offloads certain elements of cognition onto other animals. Dogs do a lot of our thinking for us historically, for example, that None of the, we don't have to wait for the future for this. We have already been transformed. We are constantly transforming. So there's the kind of inbuilt nostalgia for a humanity that's going to be left behind in this material without a sense that it's always being left behind simply by virtue of what we are and what we do. Um, essentially, the problems laid out here strike me as a nature versus culture problem. Uh, and what this document seems to preserve is a notion of nature where the human is as traditionally understood uh, it, that's where the human can be located and that they are here to bring culture to us. And again, this all seems to be very ill considered. And, uh, and I think we can, we as scholars can do a lot of work to undo this work um, and complicate it. And I just want to indicate here that I'm aware of, this, of the problem of so-called artificial intelligence agents, large language models like chat GPT, machine learning, uh, for generating images and so forth. And we can talk about that during the Q&A, if you like. I will say I'm highly skeptical of it. And I think the issue with uh, large language models is that we're not equipped to assess whether or not this material that is being generated is accurate or useful unless we are already an expert in the material that's being generated. Uh, we can't expect it to do our thinking for us because we can't assess whether it's any good unless we can think ourselves to judge it. So I ask you simply to be very skeptical about claims for the world transformational power of large language models. Again, we can bring that up during the Q&A. So um, I also want to emphasize some particular cliches of the human that I encounter repeatedly. And perhaps you, once I make you aware of this, you will be very, very aware of this as well. Um, a man named Justin Lee writes, it's deeply human to desire to live in beauty, but it's profoundly anti-human to hoard beauty for yourself while destroying what beauty can be enjoyed by the less fortunate. It's deeply human. I'm really struck by that. Or an editorial that was from last weekend at the New York Times. Uh, somebody wrote about uh, large language models. It's everyday automation says that the way to be more productive and to earn more money is to use our technology to become more human again. Uh, and again, I'm struck by that word human in both those instances. Or here's something from early on in the pandemic. This particular editorial has a headline, we're losing our humanity and the pandemic is to blame. Or we have this article, this headline, dogs have an instinct for human kindness. Uh, and again, this should all strike you as quite interesting. In every one of these instances, when they use the word human, they are presumably not talking about the bipedal ape that's largely hairless, that's of a certain size, that has a certain number of fingers and toes. They're not talking about a particular genetic makeup or a particular capacity for this species to reproduce with other members of its species and to produce children. They're not talking in a biological way, they're talking about something else. And what is that? Well, there's a basic notion that humanity is good. To, that to talk about something as humane or behaving in a human fashion is to talk about something that's doing something that's admirable and that any act of violence is understood as an act of bestiality or brutality. That word brutality comes from the Latin brutus, which means a non-human or irrational animal. Uh, ferocity is also something that's considered to be unhuman or inhuman. Ferocity comes from the Latin word ferox, again, which has to do with a wildness, a non-human animality. That in all this kind of material, we find that human humanity is often under threat. So there's a fear of us becoming mechanistic, a fear of us losing our humanity. That phrase losing our humanity is very frequent. Uh, and that in all this thinking or almost non-thinking about this word human, uh, what they mean here is basically, I think, is that the humanity is what escapes 
mechanicity that it's considered as a contrast to machines that we are something that is more than mechanical that we are something that's more than calculation that we can't be confined only by numbers these seem to be the unstated elements of this particular cliche uh, so essentially that in all this thinking uh, the hu human being human is a source of surprise it's a source of openness it's a source of freedom, and that those who are most human have most access to free choice. They are the least dominated by numbers, by mechanicity, by instinct, by violence, that they are good people, and that they are able to do things by their own decision through rational thinking and to bring about something that wasn't there before. It's quite striking. But combined with this, if you encounter the phrase to humanize, to humanize some, someone or to humanize a fictional character is generally means to show them as vulnerable, to stress their limits, and their attachments, to show them as people who are attached to their family emotionally, to show them as someone who is disappointed, to show them as someone who is vulnerable, as capable of being injured. So very frequently in a film, you'll have a character who is extremely well organized and quite frightening, and then they will humanize that character, and I use that in quotes, by showing them crying in a particular scene. And then that way we get a sense of them as a full human being. And so there seems to be a very interesting tension in this cliched notion of the human between the human as a source of kind of surprise and openness and freedom and free will, and the human is something that is able to be injured by its particular emotional attachments. Okay, so what can pre-modernists offer to all of this? Uh, here I have an image from a, a recent exhibition in Brooklyn, Duke Riley's uh, a uh, plastic bottle here painted to look like carved bone. It says yesterday is history. What does pre-modern studies have to offer? Well, uh, we can of course explore the prehistory of the idea of human perfection, that thing that transhumanism is offering us. We can also do the prehistory of ideas of reason, free choice and happiness. And I will do that again within the material that I know well, which is the material of the Western uh, Western European Middle Ages. Um, it will help us understand that key concepts like freedom, rational debate, the future, and so on need to be considered. They can't simply be accepted. So it helps combat uh, the idea that only new things are worth considering, which is something that we often encounter in universities and we certainly encounter in the marketplace. Um, it, it helps combat the notion that we don't have, we can't take the time to do the kind of archival and deep historical thinking that's required of us as historical cultural scholars uh, to say that, in fact, the work that we do, and particularly that I do, and people like me, is of some value. It also helps combat the arrogance and the danger of present minded ignorance of people who don't know the historical historical material and they don't think of it's any of it it's of any value because they don't they don't know it and they don't understand how the ideas that they're talking about actually emerge over the course of centuries centuries or millennia so what can we do as pre-modern studies well let me offer some examples a kind of prehistory of transhumanism and here i'm going to be speaking about mainstream medieval latin resurrection theology which is a mouthful uh, and I have an image here from a particular apocalypse showing the moment of the resurrection and the last judgment in uh, Christianity for Roman Catholicism uh, here in the 14th century. Once again, mainstream medieval Christian resurrection theology is a kind of prehistory of transhumanism. So one thing to stress about the idea of the, of the human subject in this particular body of work is that the human subject is psychosomatic. It is both body and soul. So we often think of Western thought as something that dis distinguishes very clearly uh, that the human self is actually located entirely in the soul rather than in the body. But the mainstream idea in this body of work is that we are a combination of body and soul, and that without body, we are incomplete. This means that after we die, we have to get our bodies back. That So in mainstream 
um, medieval Christian resurrection theology, at the last judgment, bodies and souls are reunited to make the complete person. You get your original body back. This is something I want to stress in this particular doctrine. And if you'd like during the Q&A, I can explain in more detail about how this works, uh, because there are, of course, all kinds of complications involving food in particular and growth. Um, but the effect of this, uh, the completeness of the individual person to preserve individuality, because if everyone's resurrected only as souls, you have the danger of what's called monopsychism. If the soul is perfected in the afterlife, then it's very difficult to distinguish one individual from another because the characteristic of perfection is to be one, to be basically like everything else. Perfection is an idea that is uncomfortable with heterogeneity, it tends towards homogeneity. So by resurrecting bodies, we also manage to distinguish one soul from another by having a kind of multiple perfection of bodies. So it's very important for the individual to have bodily resurrection. And we can talk more about that during the Q&A, if you like. But the one thing I really want to stress, and this is where the transhumanist element comes in, is that in this theology, the body is perfected. We have a body without any of the problems of the body. The body is now perfectly subject to reason. And if you want to read more about, about that in more detail, one of the representative figures of uh, mainstream medieval Christian resurrection theology is uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, who wrote in the Summa Theologica, a great deal about resurrection and the difficulties of trying to imagine how it works. And uh, I can share this PowerPoint out with people and people can, can read through that online. Uh, the fe the fe other features of the body is that it's completely invulnerable. It can't be injured and it has near instantaneous motion. Uh, he also writes about the various other qualities of the body that it can, uh, it can glow in the dark. Um, that it has no need to eat or drink. He says we are resurrected with our bodies entire, that we have our genitalia, that we have our intestines and so on, but we don't need to use them anymore because we are no longer vulnerable. And again, the resemblance of the resemblances between this, um, between transhumanism and this resurrection material, I think should be fairly obvious that we have this fantasy of bodily perfection, of immortality, of sensory enhancement, of uh, unlimited motion, almost unlimited motion. And then I want to talk about the kind of key features of what, of what it means to be human, kind of bear down on that particular problem. What I have represented here is a book by Anselm Olza, who's a scholar in Germany, who's written a number of books about uh, late medieval philosophy and the way they thought about uh, human thinking versus animal thinking and how they distinguish very strongly between the ways that humans think and that animals think and the kind of anxiety around that material. And again, I, I recommend his work very highly if you want to get a, a sense of the primary sources that I am um, melding together in my talk today. So the key definition of what it means to be human that runs through a lot of this material derives from a commentary called the Isagoge by Porphyry the Phoenician, where he defines humans this way. Man is the rational, moral animal. That means this. Uh, we are animal because we are alive, so we're not like rocks. Uh, we are moral because we die, so we are unlike gods. Um, and we're rational. Uh, which makes us unlike the non-human animals, which are considered to be irrational. Hold on. Man is the rational, mortal animal. So the question is, what, is, what does reason get us? Um, it gets us unpredictability. It gets us super sensory thinking. It gets us moral responsibility. It gets us access to the future and so on. That is in this body of medieval thinking, which is repeated in many ways in modern thinking, uh, non-human animals are understood to be capable only of doing the same thing over and over again. They often say that every spider's web is essentially the same, but a human can build a house in a variety of ways. Every bird nest of a particular species is always essentially the same, but humans can build 
their structures in a variety of ways. Uh, reason is understood to be able to, to think without the need for any particular sensory apparatus. It doesn't need eyes or nose or skin in order to do its thinking. And so reason is a particular mode of apprehension that is independent of the senses, independent of the body. And that is the reason why, according to this logic, that the rational soul is able to live forever because it's not tied to the body. It gets us moral responsibility, according to these thinkers. Animals are considered to have no moral responsibility. They are sometimes put on trial and I can talk about that more in more detail during the Q&A, if you like. But essentially, mainstream thinking holds that only humans are moral, morally responsible, that only, we are the only ones who can choose to do good or to do evil. Uh, and because of all these things, we are able to create a world in the future that isn't here in the present. Okay, so these are all the things that reason supposedly gets us. And I want to offer up a challenge to that, uh, to, to these notions of reason by switching very quickly to a, a modern example. So one of the things you know about America, and this is even for people who aren't in America, which is most of our uh, attendees today, is that we have a lot of gun violence. Uh, more than between 40 and 50,000 people uh, die every year in America from gun violence. And uh, I don't know, know the number of people who are injured by guns. Most recently, uh, we've had a number of news reports on people being shot and killed because they have, are driving and they've driven to the wrong address. And as they're trying to leave the house that they've accidentally driven to, the owner of the house comes out and quote unquote defends their property by shooting the person in the car. And in a couple instances, they've killed the people. And in some cases, of course, they don't always kill the person. Not in every case do they actually manage to even shoot the person. They shoot the car, for example. So in Florida, for example, there was a, a 19 and 20 year old were doing grocery delivery. They pulled, they pulled into the wrong house. They realized they're at the wrong address. They start to back out. They hit something on the property as they're trying to back out and the owner comes out and yells at them and then yells at them to leave his property and then he shoots at them and happily the people who he's shooting at are uninjured the car is injured but the people manage to to get away without being killed or injured uh, and what's really striking to me is this phrase about the shooter it says his actions were justified by his fear um, what's striking to me here is that he is rendered morally irresponsible in a way to exonerate him from what I think we should recognize as a crime, as an act of violence, and to say that he, because he was not thinking, he is somehow innocent. He has been rendered, which is to say that basically the quality of being a rational human animal is something that can be suspended at various moments for the benefit of certain subjects. Uh, I should stress that this is also, if you look at the people who are involved in this, this is an obvious case of racism. The people he's shooting at were black. I don't think the shooter was dark skinned at all. Um, and so uh, he might argue that his fear is rationally based and we can keep pushing away at that, maybe psychoanalytically, psychoanalytically and politically to note that basically the question of reason and moral responsibility and irrationality and the lack of moral responsibility are things that are enormously complicated and they don't map clearly onto a notion of being human or not being human. So let me offer up a particular medieval example to really illustrate how this works. So as I promised at the beginning of my talk, I'd be talking about the notion of the cynocephalus, of the dog-headed person, these legendary beings. These come out of a work called The Natural History, first century work by a Latin writer named Pliny the Elder. Um, and he imagines that basically ge geographical and epistemological remoteness overlap. That is the further you get from home, the stranger things become. This is a feature of travel writing, probably worldwide, that if a traveler gets very far from home, it's expected that things are gonna be extremely weird. Um, but what do we know about these people out there on the fringes of things, these people who are According to Pliny, you will encounter cyclops, people with one eye on their forehead. You will encounter the so-called skiopods, shadow feet, people who have one foot that they use as a kind of an umbrella, uh, people who live by simply smelling apples. They don't eat any food. They simply smell apples. Uh, people who are pygmies, people are very, very short. Um, people are giants. And people who have their heads 
in their chest, the so-called blemmy, and the cynocephaly, the dog-headed people. How do you know if they're people or not? Uh, what term can we use to talk about them? Well, uh, the uh, Augustine, who's a foundational writer for the Christian Middle Ages, a North African bishop of Carthage, in his work, The City of God, early fifth century, argues that no matter how strange the shape of a being, if they are descended from Adam, legendarily in the Christian mythology and Jewish mythology is understood to be the first person, if they're descended from Adam genealogically, then they are considered to be human. So there's a genealogical argument. Um, and that's quite interesting, but it's also rather hard to prove because how do you know whether or not this dog-headed person or being or animal that you've just met, met is descended from Adam? You can't know by simply meeting them um, because that's a historical argument. So there's a much later writer, a guy named Bertrandus Corby, who's an abbot in Northern France in the ninth century, writes a letter that considers this problem in a lot of detail. It's called the letter on the cynocephaly or the dog heads. Um, and I can say more during the Q and A about the missionary context of this particular letter about why he's writing it. But the thing I wanna stress um, when he's writing this letter, trying to consider whether or not cynocephaly are human, is he's digging in his monastery's library. He finds a great deal of legendary material about them. He compiles it into a single document, and this is what he concludes. It is added to those things to which your letter bears witness, he's writing to someone else, that all the kinds of domesticated animals that are kept in our region are kept among them, among the cynocephaly. I see that this could in no way be if they had a base deal and not a rational soul, since the living things of the earth were subjected to men by heaven, as we know from reading Genesis. But it has never been heard or believed that animals of one kind can by themselves take care of other animals, especially those of a domestic kind, keep them, compel them to submit to their rule and follow regular routines. How does he prove that these dog-headed people are people? He proves it by showing that they domesticate animals. Again, he is drawing from material he's reading. He's never, of course, met a cynocephalus. He will never meet a cynocephalus. They don't actually exist. They exist only in his fantasy. But what's interesting to me here is the kind of argument he makes and what this argument tells us about the history of the concept of reason and the question of who gets to count as rational. And what's striking to me is that he proves this not on the basis of imagining that they write books, or that they do philosophy, or that they make art, or they make inventions, or that they have religion, or any of the other things we might think of as particular to be an irrational being, but rather he makes this proof by reference to their domination of other animals. And to say, because these other animals essentially submit to their governance, that means there must be some difference between them. And what better name for that difference? And this is something that Augustine himself says, what better name for that difference? What enables that difference? than reason itself. And if we want to bear down on this, I think we can look at these figures as kind of allegories of that, the kind of in, internal violence of this notion of being human by imagining uh, the kind of interesting element of the head of this particular creature, the sight of thinking and of reason being uh, the head of an animal. Uh, this is a sort of representation of that kind of intimate relationship between violence, animality, and reason. And again, we can take this up in more detail during the Q&A, if you like. I also want, I'm going to offer up two more medieval examples before I draw to a close. Um, this is from a very widely read work uh, from the Middle Ages, or actually really right before the Middle Ages, all the way through the, to the present. It's a work called The Constellation of Philosophy by Boethius. Uh, this is sixth century prison literature. Boethius was a uh, uh, Roman politician under after the end of the Roman, Western Roman Empire. He was serving the so-called barbarian uh, emperors, and he got mixed up in the wrong politics and ended up imprisoned, accused of treason, and he would be executed for treason. Uh, but while he was in prison, he wrote this, which is his final work, which is trying to find some way to be consoled by philosophy as he's cut off from his family, cut off from his wealth, um, and he's expecting his inevitable execution. Uh, this work is read almost continuously for the next, uh, really through to the present, it's translated into many, many languages. So it's, it's a quite 
popular work. Um, the argument that Boethius makes is kind of a, a double argument. It is against the false temporal gifts of fortune. As he writes, you want to rid yourself of hope and fear. He says that everything that is merely temporal is something that never really belonged to us in the first place. So our attachment to our reputation, to our social status, to our children, to our family, even to beautiful landscapes, none of this really matters because it's simply temporal. It doesn't really matter. Um, so we need to attach ourselves to eternal things. We need to attach ourselves to God and seek our consolation in something that is reliable, that never changes. In the course of doing this, he also needs to carve out space for free choice. And that's a very elaborate argument that I'm not gonna go into detail here in this talk. Um, but I do wanna stress that what enables free choice, according to Boethius, for human beings is this intellectual capacity that he calls reason. And this word reason appears very many times in the constellation of philosophy, the, the Latin word ratio and its variants. It appears more than 100 times. It's an extremely common word in it. And one thing I've done is I've traced the various ways that this word reason gets used. Um, one of the most striking ways that the word reason gets used is reason as a cause. Uh, what is the reason for this thing happening? Uh, what is the reason, say, my my cup fell off the table. When we're using reason like that, we're not using reason in the sense really of thinking. We're using it in a sense of kind of inevitability. It's a kind of material or physical argument of cause and effect that's completely non-subjective because it happens out there in the real world. And that what we do as rational subjects is we try to discover these reasons. It's a very interesting thing, a kind of complicated thing to say, to use the same word for thinking as for the kind of inevitable non-subjective activities of the physical world. That's really striking to me, first of all. And when I realized that, uh, I realized that the word reason in Boethius kind of has an inhuman quality. And, and I, that helped me uh, realize, to keep using that word, that for Boethius, uh, what it means to be rational is to align ourselves with God's self-sufficient singular perfection. That the only truly rational activity is to attach ourselves to God's unchanging existence. With that in mind, although reason is incredibly important for Boethius in terms of establishing um, human freedom, as he claims, it doesn't seem to have freedom in any sense that we understand it because the only truly rational decision is a decision to align ourselves with God's unitary perfection. Um, in, as he describes it, basically, the human can do one of two things. We can either give up on that perfection and, as it were, look down towards the ground with the other animals to give up on eternity and attach ourselves to temporal things and basically live like a beast. Or we can look up towards God, towards the heavens, and attach ourselves to his perfection. But in no way in that either looking up or looking down does he imagine there's any particular human activity. To be human for Boethius is simply to carve out a brief space where we can decide to be an animal or to be a god. Uh, and that's really striking to me. Again, this notion of reason and its attachment to freedom seems to be enormously complicated in Boethius, and it seems to be unrecognizable according to any of the cliches of, of, the, of humanity that we encountered earlier in my talk. So what inspired my interest in Boethius in particular is this, uh, when someone tells you in an argument, why can't you just be reasonable? What was striking to me is when someone says that to you, they're not asking you to think. They're asking you to agree with them. They're asking you to stop thinking. To just be reasonable in Boethius, as in those arguments, is really to kind of give up in a way to try to seek an end to your free choice by looking for the one correct answer. And so there's something, I think, quite inhuman about rationality in Boethius. And indeed, as I'm going to trace in my next book, really through the entire history of reason. So as I say, truly free choice means obedience to reason. And again, during Q&A, we can talk about what it means for these notions of rational free choice to emerge in a Mediterranean slave society, which is something that it's also quite important. My last medieval example, 
and thank you for sticking sticking with me for the talk, comes from a early, sort of late 13th, early 14th century mystical thinker, a woman named Margaret Perrette, who wrote a work called The Mirror of Simple Souls Who Are Annihilated and Remain Only in Will and Desire of Love. So she is a mystical thinker, and she wrote a mystical handbook. And what she does with this notion of human, of humanity and human reason is quite quite interesting. I hope it's interesting to you as well. So to give you a very, very quick historical background to this particular individual. So um, Boethius was, was executed. So was Margaret Perrette. Uh, she wrote this mystical handbook, Your Mirror of Simple Souls. Uh, she wrote it in French. She circulated it. Uh, she was told not to circulate it by various members of the official church. And she persisted in doing that. And as a result, and also as a result of various elements in French politics at the time. She was uh, arrested. She was interrogated. She was then burned to death in the middle of Paris on the 1st of June, 1310, alongside uh, a Jew who had been forcibly converted to Christianity and then returned to his uh, original faith. Uh, that's quite interesting in itself and horrible. So in this argument, which is a guide to, uh, to basically be getting as close to God as possible, through mystical and spiritual and meditative practices, um, she is making an argument that reason can get you only so far. This is actually quite usual. This is something you encounter in a lot of medieval Christian uh, spiritual handbooks. And indeed, I think you probably encounter this worldwide in other forms of spirituality. So to give an example of the kind of material that she might have known, probably from talking to people from the culture, because I don't think she read Latin, uh, Richard of St. Victor's work called The Mystical Ark, where he writes about a contemplation that rises above reason, one that goes still further by admitting no human reason at all. And again, this is this is quite usual. It's really usual in this kind of material to distinguish between lower and higher reasons. So what's in Latin called scantia is a lower reason, which simply deals with material things, with your accounting and so on, building a house, making clothes and so on, and sapientia, which deals with higher things. There's always this effort to kind of split reason into finer and finer details. But what makes Margaret Perrette unusual is what she says about reason. She says that reason is animal. She says, for example, truly the unsophistication and burden of those who are governed by reason surpasses all description. Reason's teachings are a donkey's work. So again, if humans are the rational mortal animal, and if humans in mainstream medieval thinking under, are understood paradigmatically as rational and non-human animals are understood paradigmatically as irrational, it's lacking reason, it's really quite shocking to find that this thinker, Margaret Perrette, has said that reason itself is animal. And this is something she repeats throughout this work many, many times. Anybody who obeys reason are donkeys who seek God in creation. Uh, they are bestial and asinine. And why is she doing this? It's because for her, reason is actually insufficiently free. It's insufficiently open. It's tied to it's tied to logic, it's tied to cause and effect, it's tied to proving things in time. She's seeking something that's outside of time, outside of mere cause and effect, something that's attached to the infinite potentiality of God and his absolute imponderable oneness. Reason can't get us there. She wants more and she wants more freedom. So essentially, in looking for a freedom that's beyond reason, she is attached to this notion of freedom, a free choice of uh, openness to the future that reason promises us. And she finds that reason itself is wanting. So ultimately, I don't think that she's given up really on the promises of reason. It's that she's found reason itself inadequate to what it is that she's trying to do. Uh, but she's preserving this notion of freedom and futurity that reason typically promises by saying that reason itself is animal. So again, in uh, with Rotranus of Corby and his letter on the Sinocephaly, we have a notion of reason that's demonstrated through the domination of non-human animals, and it's proved to be to exist through that domination. With Boethius, we have this notion of reason, which doesn't seem to be connected to any kind of free and open choice as we understand it, but is rather attached to this single 
correct answer that God provides. And with Margaret Perrette, we have this notion of animal reason, and reason is animalized because it is insufficiently free. And again, this is something that I think we can, is a representative feature of what we can do as pre-modern scholars, that we can bring this kind of knowledge to our notion of what it can, what it means to be human and complicate this term enormously. So I'm going to conclude with a, something that's very inspirational to me, a work that I've drawn on many times throughout my career. Jacques Derrida is the animal, therefore I am, l'animal que donc je suis. Um, and the key phrase here uh, from this work is from his chapter on the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, where he poses the question whether what calls itself human has the right rigorously to attribute to man, which means therefore to attribute to himself what he refuses the animal. Derrida's goal is not to erase the differences between humans and non-humans. And my goal here is not to do that either. I'm not here to erase those differences, to deny them. Uh, I am evidently able to do things that my cat cannot. I'm evidently able to transform the world in ways that my cat cannot. But I do want to think about that border, about the border between human and animal, the border between human and machine, notions of freedom, notions of reason, and to think about them in more detail, to question how they work historically, to think, rethink notions of intelligence, and above all, the cliches of humanity. Uh, and to every time we find that word humanity to stop and pause and ask what it is they're talking about, because they're certainly not talking about the biological existence of our being human, but rather some something mysterious. And in this talk today, I've tried to sort of plumb the depths of that mystery a bit. So uh, to show you some of my work on this, this topic, um, uh, we heard in the introduction, my first book is How to Make a Human, Animals and Violence in the Middle Ages. Um, my Last book from 2019, How Not to Make a Human, Pets for All Children, Worms, Sky Burial, and Oysters. That's what the University of Minnesota Press. And just to give you a sense of what I'm up to, uh, this is my most recent article. This came out in uh, late December or early January. It's an article about a, a poem called Pierce Plowman. It's a Middle English poem. And talking about wolf hunting and the kind of politics of wolf hunting in that work. So uh, thank you for listening to me and I am happy to take your question. Let me begin with, uh, with, with a very simple question and perhaps just uh, to play the devil's advocate and then put out the elephant in the room uh, by asking, you know, um, you, you talked about the cliche of, of humanism. Um, and and do you think how useful this concept of a humanism or human rights or um, a justice based um, uh, a movement or theory do you think they still uh, valid you know um, yeah I can try to address that and again you know uh, while acknowledging my particular limitations as a, as a literary scholar. Uh, and not as a legal scholar, and not as a, you know, I don't, I'm not involved any more than anybody else is in politics. Um, what's striking to me is that the notion of human rights really obviously needs to think about what, what we're talking about when we mean human. Are we talking about humans as rational, deliberative subjects, in which case there's questions of uh, the rights of uh, subjects that don't seem to have the same rational capacities as other humans. If there's a if the if the notion of an adult uh, human subject is considered to be normative, then what do we do with children? What do we do with with uh, people who are, are experiencing mental illness? Uh, what do we do with people who are traditionally historically considered to be outside of reason? Uh, what actions are considered to be the rational actions that would be uh, a definition of them as a human being? Right, and all these things I think need will be put into question if we're bringing a post-humanist framework to this to say that these notions of reason are uncertain, or are we coming at it from the notion of of vulnerability, significant vulnerability? That, that the notion of the humanize uh, to humanize someone is to talk about their particular attachments, their attachments to family, their attachments to particular needs for shelter or particular forms of dignity of clothing, for example, or kinds of clothing or kinds of religious practice, or kinds of cultural expression. So are we coming at this from reason, which is a kind of 
potential to do something? Or are we coming at this from vulnerability, which is a kind of uh, openness to being injured? And again, um, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But I think it's something that has to be considered when we're talking about the notion of human rights. Uh, again, a post-humanist framework, I think, helps explode sentiment and notions of, of the human. Um, and so uh, we also have a question here uh, about emotion. Um, and again, what's what's quite striking to me is that in the kind of mainstream Western philosophical tradition that I've been examining, uh, emotion is often understood to be um, devalued. Um, it's uh, acts of extreme rage are understood to be animal, uh, understood to be uh, acts of ferocity. There is a particular werewolf story where there is a notion of a there's a story of a werewolf who attacks somebody who's done him wrong, and there's a real question in this particular story from the 12th century about whether that's an act of animal violence or whether that's an act of a human who who feels that he's been done wrong, uh, and it's quite in, undecidable. Uh, but then we have questions like love, where Many of us, I think, think about our love attachments or attachments to our uh, spouses, for example, uh, or to our children or to our family as the kind of most emblematic aspects of ourselves, the thing that expresses who we are uh, most indelibly. Um, but what is that love? Is it something that we calculate and choose rationally? If we do, it doesn't really sound like love, does it? It sounds like something that is mechanistic. So there's a kind of Emotion also kind of carves out a space for mystery and uncertainty that I think is untouchable by uh, positive or absolute definitions of the human. And that, that, that to me is quite interesting also about, about the, the role of emotion in all this. Uh, also the question I think of whose emotions are understood to be valid. Um, and again, to think about that man in Florida who shot at those grocery delivery people that he's considered to be innocent because of his fear, um, that because his fear removed him from reason, or maybe his fear was arrived at rationally. The article doesn't explain that. Um, and where does that intersect with it, with his humanity? Um, so that's that's also quite interesting to me. Um, yeah, um, I okay, I I think I I muted everybody, so perhaps that's why people can't raise their oh, hands. Well, they they can raise their hands, and then you can unmute them, and, and yeah. we can we can hope that they are a, a human being. Who's here to ask them like ask a good question? Yeah, and, and while we're still waiting for questions, please just turn on your camera. Feel free to do so. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, Professor Steele. Thanks for your inspiring speech. You know, um, I uh, from your speech, I know that the post-humanism redefined the notion of um a human being, the the reason. And you know some such other theory like the thing theory, they redefined and more, um, and they say that and more has the agency or the vitality. So such kind of theory uh, diminished the distinction between human being and non-human beings. And what do you think the um, you know the potential challenges posed by such kind of tendency to the future research of ecocriticism? You know, we have a lot of theory to diminish the distinction between non-human and the, the human being. So um, I was wondering the potential challenges or the maybe the new field of research. Thanks. Great. Now, thank you for that question. So I, I write about this uh, in some detail in my, my last book. So with that unusual title for that book, the, the last chapter of it is called Oysters. Um, and that's where I talk about this notion of material agency. Uh, the oyster, and I'll try to do this very quickly because it's a, it's a long chapter. Uh, in the history of thought that I'm studying, uh, the oyster is considered to be an, uh, the animal that is the animal that's the most plant-like. It is the minimal animal. It's the animal that's in between at the absolute border of being plant and being, being animal. And so it's a way for thinkers from the classical period really through the, to the Enlightenment from basically Plato to Diderot to think about what it means to be af, absolute bare life as an animal. The oyster is, the, is, that, is that very figure. Um, and 
What's striking to me is it's a form of life that seems to have no agency whatsoever. Uh, it can't, an oyster can't do anything it, in this body of thought. It can't do anything. It is, as uh, one commentator said, it is a life of pure pleasure, it is the life closest to death. And so it's a way to think about completely non agential life. And what was striking to me about thinking about and writing about the oyster is that in many ways, um, the, the goal of someone like, say, Jane Bennett, for example, in Vibrant Matter, would be to offer that oyster a touch of what she calls anthropomorphism, to recognize the agency of oysters, to look at the way that this these shoals of creatures challenge notions of the differences between object and subject, agency and passivity. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's quite interesting. But I think there's also something quite valuable uh, that's about recognizing how we are very much like oysters ourselves. That is the extension of agency to uh, material things or to barely sentient beings like oysters is a kind of extension of our own human free choice to them. It seems to be uh, a kind of uh, inclusive humanization of these beings. Again, as Jane Bennett says, a touch of anthropomorphism. Um, and it seems to, in that way, to preserve the particular arrogances of being human, something that I want to challenge as a post-humanist thinker. So I ask in that chapter, what does it mean then to not offer oysters a touch of anthropomorphism, but rather to imagine us as oysterized, as, as it were, to consider ourselves as creatures that need to live someplace, that are mm -hmm. uh, subject to environmental degradation, that most of our lives is dependent. We have to be in a particular place. We are mortal. We have to live someplace. We are vulnerable. We are uh, not fully in control of our world. And which is to say that um, I think we there's been a lot of very good work done in, in post-humanist thinking and eco-criticism in thinking about this notions of agency. But what I'm trying to do in some of my work on, on thinking about oysters and humans together is to reverse that polarity and to think about the ways that we are, uh, as humans, largely non-agential and to try to build possibly an ethics out of that that begins with a lack of a lack of agency is maybe the place to begin thinking. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Okay, now, now let's turn to uh, uh, Professor Robert Jill, please. Robert? Um, uh, maybe let's move to uh, uh, Professor Elisa. Are they old? Oh, here you go. Uh, uh, sorry, okay. I have managed to. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Uh, thank you, thank you for the talk. That was really good. Um, there are lots of things, but perhaps the main um, query I think for you is, um, and how this, how, how your particular um, analysis of the, of this pre-modern context relates to post-humanism more gen generally. Do, do you think that um, that what something like the the Boethius example? offers is um is something that 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 we would need to read boethius and other scholars like that for or or, or do you think that that um the insights of this of this pre-modern culture that you're talking about is that almost like an ontological component of of how we are as humans do, do you think that we that we inevitably recognize rationality as being and reason as being, you know, flawed and, and animal-like. Is that your argument? Or do you think that, th th that these are just a, a, a specific historical culture that produces that thought that we need to go and look at those texts in order to be able to, um, to use that idea now in the, in the kind of crisis that we're in at the moment? Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, well, I mean, as a pre-modern scholar, of course, my, my goal is always to make people read pre-modern texts. So that's that's my you know I have I have an interest in making people do that. So I will put that put that front and forward. But that's about my professional uh, position rather than my intellectual position, if if you will. Um, I think the real advantage of reading Boethius, for example, uh, is to understand 
that these terms have a history. Uh, and that without understanding that history, I think we are inclined to use these words like human, reason, animal, and so on in ways that are somewhat unthinking because we, we tend to receive them as kind of natural uh, abstract categories that are not particularly examined. And I think probably the, the easiest shortcut to re-examining these terms is indeed to think about them historically in the way that Foucault, for example, uh, examined notions of sex and gender historically uh, with enormous worldwide social effects. Um, and I think we can do similar work with notions of being human, of being re re of reason, notions of freedom. And again, it's one of the reasons I wanna stress that notions of freedom, at least in Western philosophy, have their origin in uh, a slave economy in the notion or freedom is actually a particular legal status with the ability to dominate other people. Um, and to talk about free will in that context is extremely fraught. And I think recognizing those the particular kind of historical sedimentation of these concepts um, to be able to kind of shake that up. I think, again, I think the shortest way to do that, easiest way to do that is to read uh, what some of these historical people have said about the notion of reason. And again, like what counts as a valid historical text is gonna differ from uh, field to field. Uh, you could read Thomas Paine, you could read Boethius, or indeed uh, are, there are many uh, attendees here who are, uh, worldwide will have their own historical traditions that they can draw on. But I, I would urge everybody to, uh, whatever these kind of cliched terms are, to, to dig deep. Because I think you will find that once you start to think about them, um, historically, they will, these ideas will seem to you simultaneously um, familiar. You'll go, oh, it's very surprising to find this idea said 2,000 years ago. But also kind of defamiliarized, because you will see the kind of world that these concepts that you're using now belong to and that world they belong to is, is quite alien. And you will find the ways that you are kind of carrying on these ideas in kind of a zombie way. Um, so that, that, and that's my goal, you know, and I, and I, I would be curious to see what, what happens whenever people do this. Thank Actually, you. You, you just make me, oh, uh, Robert, I'm sorry. Uh, you just made me start to think of Taoism as a kind of transhuman project. The idea mm -hmm. of searching for eternity, you know, in the pre-modern time is very interesting. So, um, Robert, do you have other questions to follow up? Um, well, I, I, I mean, just very briefly, if you like, I mean, maybe this is just me trying to kind of uh, uh, show off a, a little piece of historical knowledge, which, which sometimes people do have these, these things. So I apologize before I do it. But when you started off by talking about post, you know, this, this post-human project to try and transcend mortality, yeah. that made me think of like Gilgamesh and, you know, the, yes. the almost right yeah. from the start, there has been this attempt to be immortal. So may, again, maybe that's, I don't know whether that's an ontological thing or whether that's, you know, on, an ontologically human thing or whether that is just the product of a, you know, a, a civilization with cities and agriculture, et cetera, because of course that's a... Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a wonderful point, right? And if we had lots and lots of time, we can dig at this notion, this historical notion that uh, it's often said that uh, many thinkers will say that only humans are aware of death and, and you know animals never really die, they only perish, that's what Heidegger says. Uh, and then people counter that by saying, well, we have, have we have never have any direct apprehension of our death. Death is the thing that's always beyond our ability to apprehend it. So in a sense, we never really die ourselves. We never experience it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so there's there's a great deal of fun to be had as well with these ideas. Thanks for your questions, Robert. Uh, yeah, Eliza? Thank you. thank you so much, Carl. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah. So I have, I think, two questions, maybe. Um, the first is that I'm I'm struck. It seems to me my my hypothesis based on hearing you would be that AI has taken the place of God in our contemporary paradigms in the sense that there's the same kind of ambivalence. It's simultaneously, um, you know, a wonderful thing. We have to harness this power um, to enhance our own rationality. But then the main complaints I hear about ChatGPT from my colleagues who teach literature is that the papers are too formulaic. There's something. Mm -hmm not human enough, they're not vulnerable enough or not emotional. I don't know. I don't know how to fill in that that uh, blank in the formula, but I see the same ambivalence as in um, as in the material you described about God. So I'm curious if you would agree with that hypothesis. That's the first question. And then the second question is that as, as you show, we've been using these kind of like 
extended mind prostheses forever as humans, right? A quote unquote artificial intelligence is nothing new. So my question is, is why we think it is? I mean, what is it about, <laughs> which is really naive, right? But what has changed in the past um, 25 years or however long, however you would define the chronology to make us all of a sudden think that there's something new happening? Well, I, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, my, my sense is that it feels artificial because it's new. Um, that what passes as, as culture, what passes as nature is something that simply uh, we've forgotten that was ever, that was ever new. You know, um, certainly uh, the domestication of dogs felt artificial, I'm sure, at some point 10,000 years ago. Um, so that's that's one thing. Like, why now? I think why now is in part marketing. There's a kind of um, softwareification of engineering, which is um, at least online and on in the online space that uh, really puts a premium on notions of newness. And so I'm I'm highly suspicious of it. I'm I'm suspicious about it because it feels it feels like marketing. I'm suspicious of it because I encounter the word artificial intelligence, and I don't feel that that word artificial has been sufficiently historicized. It feels like a, a restatement of the kind of old nature culture division, um, and it, it doesn't really ask questions about to what degree we as humans are already always already artificial, and indeed to the degree that other animals are possibly always already artificial too, that we can't have an absolute distinction of culture and nature. You can see my, my indebtedness to Derrida, for example, here, or even to someone like Raymond Williams in his, his working called on the, on, on the City and the Country. Um, also, I mean, the, even the notion of intelligence is really funny when we're talking about uh, large language models. Because what is the large language model, but basically the ability to uh, what, what these things are used for is to produce plausible text, something that sounds like the sort of things a person might say. They are uh, algorithms that operate through text prediction. They are therefore, by their very nature, incapable of really saying anything new. There may be interesting new patterns and we can raise questions about the ability of anything to really be creative and to bring something new into existence. But it's quite interesting to me that a large language model's uh, orientation uh, is towards producing text that looks like a human might have said it. So they are particularly useful for the kind of writing that requires the least thought. That is, um, it's very good for memos. It's very good for university mission statements. Uh, but when you really want to try to say something new, a large language model is inadequate. Um, and so it's very in interesting to me that people use the term artificial intelligence for this, because it really feels like the mechanization of what looks like human expression. But in, in fact, you know, under bureaucracy, so much of human expression is indeed mechanized. But again, we can challenge that and ask, for example, about a prayer or other forms of ritual language, which are themselves sort of expressly human activities as we typically think of them, almost because they're ritual, because they're repeatable. So again, um, I'm not gonna offer you any absolute answer on it, except to say that our colleagues who are frightened of ChatGPT um, can design assignments that draw on things like classroom discussion because chat GPT doesn't know what it is we're talking about in our classes. Or they can require a particular analysis of text and particular attention to passages. Uh, and chat GPT is very bad at it. It's bad at meter. It's bad at scansion. Uh, it certainly doesn't know material in Latin. So I have sometimes assigned material that I've translated out of Latin and chat GPT because it doesn't really know Latin that well and certainly doesn't know medieval Latin it can't do anything with it. So there's all kinds of ways to defeat it. I know there's a Chinese version of GTP. That, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, next uh, uh, person is a Professor uh, Xu Li Xing. Professor Xu is from uh, Taiwan National Zheng Da uh, 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 Zhengzhi University. And she is uh, she's at English department. And she actually worked on uh, uh, pre-modern uh, myth uh, from a multi-species uh, perspective, very interesting piece about what is it, what is that warm, um, 
the uh, silk, right? Silk warm and horse. And the myth about the silk warm and horse in the pre-modern time from a multi-species perspective. So uh, go ahead. Uh, Lee Shin. <laughs> well, thank you, Jaru, uh, for, for that very uh, kind, generous introduction and for hosting the talk. And Carl, I really enjoyed the talk. Today, I, I love the way you sort of set up the contrast between transhumanism and posthumanism and to, to talk about what it means to uh, travel that kind of uh, human, non-human uh, distinction there. Um, and Jaru kindly mentioned this project I'm working on, so I thought I would talk a bit about that. But my question is not really related to that at this moment. Uh, my own project is more, uh, I'm actually more a 19th century romanticism type of <laughs> scholar, but then I start because of uh, Jaru and a number of uh, my colleagues like in Taiwan that really inspire me to uh, embark on this uh, uh, journey to do a little bit more uh, start research about eco-criticism. Then I started to look at the civil, uh, the Silk War. Uh, Silk Road, history, material, culture, and how uh, mythological representation of the Siri culture tell us something about uh, like human, non-human, that kind of tension there. And so I thought uh, one point you raised earlier, probably at the very beginning, but not uh, later will be more like the, the connection between humans and, and technology in this transhumanism and how medieval uh, thinkers, the number of thinkers you mentioned, it seems that they, they might also mention uh, a bit of like the kind of uh, how human develop a special relationship with the tools they will be using. Um, but I'm not entirely sure whether that that's part of the uh, project you're working on, because I'm, I'm curious, because you mentioned this, Miro was the oldest dog headed people. And according to this letter you quoted, apparently those dog, -like, uh, dog headed people are also able, capable of domesticating animals. So um, I'm wondering whether in that kind of, I think of that kind of uh, uh, logic, whether they would consider uh, like, I wonder what role does the tool play in that kind of pre-modern uh, way of representing uh, well, humanism there, whether our tools are like nowadays where like mm. in what way, like with the transhumanism you're thinking of enhanced human abilities, um, whereas those uh, pre-modern thinkers, I wonder what, what role does the tool or instrument play there? Whether that's any 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 way related to your your uh, current research or, or, or it's a very it's a very good question. It's something that I don't I don't have a good answer to. Um, so I can I can say a little bit more about that. What's what's interesting to me, in part about that, and again I'm drawing on Derrida here, is um, you know we have this a common definition of humans is that we're a tool using animal. And then when we discover that non-human animals use tools in various ways, uh, you know, sticks mm -hmm. to, to get monkeys using sticks to get ants out of anthills and so on, mm -hmm. um, then, then there becomes the argument that we are uh, the animal that can make tools that make tools, right? There's a mm -hmm. kind of regress to this. Um, and, and we can always, we will always find in these definitions, what's, interesting is not so much the particular content of the definition, but the drive to define. The drive to distinguish humans from non-humans to find some quality that it is that we can establish a line. And it's almost like you can imagine a kind of retreat where we have to pull back and, and set up another wall, pull back and set up another wall. And uh, where we have, as Derrida calls it, it's kind of non-finite list a non-finite list of, because there's always going to be an, an additional attempt to explain what it is that we do that's particular. And this is something, for example, uh, and that material that's collected by Anselm Olza in his studies of, of animal rationality or notions of, of human rationality versus animal thinking. What's really striking to me is the way that these medieval thinkers will use phrases like quasi-reason, quasi-thinking, semi-reason, right, that they will they will identify various kinds of deliberative activities by non-human animals. So they'll tell a story, for example, about a cat that comes across 
some fish in a, in a basin and it can't get the fish out because the fish are too slippery. And so the cat removes a stopper from under the basin so the water drains out and then the cat can get in and get the fish. Um, whether this happened or not, I don't know, but I can, my cat certainly I think could, could do it. Um, and, and, they, and what's striking to me is that they want to tell the story and then in every instance they want to say, but this is not rational behavior. This is not tool use, this is not thinking. And they get these very elaborate explanations to demonstrate how this is not reasonable. And the thing that I'm studying is these kinds of anxious, uncertain attempts to defend human particularity. So um, if there is medieval thinking about uh, non-human tool use, um, there's a little, there's a little. Uh, there's a story uh, that Albert the Great tells about wolves practicing to attack sheep. They practice on logs that are roughly the same size as a sheep. Whether this happens or not, I don't know. But again, Albert the Great is gonna say, but this is not really thinking. And so it's that that's that's the phrase that interests me. This is not really thinking. This is not reasonable. This is not some. This is not the same thing that we do. And it's the mm -hmm. firm line that's always striking to me. That desire for the firm line. Mm, right. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Well, thank you, Li Xing. And uh, now let's move on to some of the questions in the chat box. Uh, we have Professor Hu uh, asking about some explanation of eco-humanism and its link to post-humanism. Uh, let's see, where is that? Uh, Professor Hu, Hu Zhihong. Let me, let me, let me repost, I okay, guess. Professor, uh, okay, Professor, you know, from Steele. So, yes. you know, post-humanism and eco-humanism, you know, nowadays is a very popular, popular maybe terms. Uh, for many, many, or eco, eco critical, you know, circles. Now, could you please say something about, yeah, uh, say something about the what is maybe what is eco humanism in your eyes, as well as its links to the term you just, ju you just talk about post humanism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can, I can try. I can try. I mean, I, I, I sort of, in a way, I would prefer that the, the people who are more deeply immersed in eco-criticism to, to make the connections themselves. Um, but the thing I do want to stress is that I feel that uh, transhumanism in its desire to escape the boundaries of, of human corporeal limitations and to persist in kind of regimes of uh, resource extraction and property and licensing uh, and so on, is I find transhumanism a kind of profoundly anti-eco-critical, anti-ecological mode of thinking and a practice. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite hostile to it. Um, but that, you know, that people may differ with me on that point. Uh, I find post-humanism more interesting. Simply, if I, if I, again, I distinguish transhumanism from post-humanism, I say transhumanism is about this technological upgrade and post-humanism is for me about questioning kind of traditional notions of what it means to be human, notions of freedom, reason, uh, human animal difference. And the connections between that and eco-criticism uh, seem to me to be relatively straightforward, but um, because it, it poses questions about basically our, distinct, our, our distinction from the world, our responsibility to it, our shared vulnerability with it, and so on. Uh, and so I think in part by having a firm line between transhumanism and posthumanism, we can also, I think, um, do better ecological thinking by uh, thinking about the ways that we ourselves are kind of natural beings. If that, if that helps, I mean, answers that question, I hope. Um, and I think uh, there's a question here about whether well, there's a vein of pessimism in transhumanism or fear that machines will dominate humanity and use hum humanity subserviently. Uh, I think that's, a, that's an absolute, it's a key element to transhumanism, certainly in terms of dystopian science fiction. But I think for the people, a lot of people involved in transhumanist uh, thinking, a lot of the 
he figures are at elite universities or they are running in circles of very well-funded technological uh, research, uh, some of it quite sketchy, things like uh, cryptocurrency and so on. Um, and so I think <laughs> these are the people, I think many of them will imagine like Peter Thiel, that they will be doing the licensing themselves, you know, that they don't be the ones who control the technology themselves. So I think there is, uh, people like me, I feel quite pessimistic, but I think someone like Peter Thiel feels quite optimistic because I think he, he thinks it's gonna make him richer and more powerful. Okay, I um, let's go by order before we reach to the last one uh, by uh, Jose, I think. The next one is somebody uh, I, I I see um, Gisela, uh Gisela Chen Jia. What is it? Okay, so so here's a question about one of the participants is a um, it's it's a it's a it's a how do you say the director of a private Chinese language school, and she's asking. How would you, if you want to talk to children about your post-mod, uh, post-humanism, how would you use your language in, you know, in a way that <laughs> we can use chat, chat GPT to do that, <laughs> explain it <laughs> to a six to two, 18 year old kids. So could you, could you sort of simplify the language in a way as if you're talking to kids so that she can take your, take your uh, talking points, right? Incorporate that into, as a, as a way of, as a, as a kind of activism. Well, I mean, I think the interest, I, I, again, the, the, the person who's asking the question works with children. Um, and so we'll know the answer better than I do, I think, um, because I, I I don't work with children. I'm, I'm familiar with them. I've met them. I've, I've been around them. Um, but what's really striking to me about children is they, um, there's very, they're, they're open to animal stories, for example, that they, they love them. They love fables. Uh, they love stories where animals talk. And it would be interesting, I think, to talk to them about that. Ask an eight-year-old, why do you like animal stories? Um, what does an animal story do for you that a, a story about people doesn't? Uh, why, why do you like this story more than this story? Um, what would happen if we changed this into a story that had chickens or foxes in it rather than stories about people and so on? And I think asking them these questions and seeing what kind of answers they produce and being open to the ways that they are themselves as new people, you know, people have been on this earth for only a few, a few years, um, reimagining notions of responsibility, of who's to blame, which is something they think about a lot as children. Um, thinking about questions of which lives are worth preserving or cherishing, um, the relationship between the food they eat and the animals they tell stories about, um, all these things. I think asking them these questions with these particular stories um, could produce extremely interesting answers. So that, that would be my answer. It's not how I would sort of take all these ideas and turn them into something that a 10-year-old can understand, but rather to kind of build from the storytelling and philosophy essentially of 10 year olds, for example, and to see what kind of answers they produce. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to another question from uh, Professor Song Li Li. Uh, actually her question, if you notice is under, under the name of Huawei. Uh, actually her, her question actually uh, inspired me to think about post-humanism in against the the uh, cultural or culture or ideology of, of human human humanist center such as Confucianism, right? Mm -hmm. In a country that is predominantly Confucianism, how do you think of post-humanism, you know, within within the framework of Confucianism, for example? So here is our question that in the past three COVID-19 years, we are forced to rethink what is the priority of thinking in the future as human beings, life on earth or metaphysical being when more and more disaster is approaching. Who is going to speak for God? Who has to, to say for God, freedom, whose freedom? A few or the majority, the poor or the rich? What health is in danger, security, sustainability? I guess she's probably think, thinking, in, not, despite all this, uh, this question, you know, the word for gods, but I, I think this could well be placed in the in a Chinese po po political or cultural context. Does that make sense, Carl? Yeah, it, may, it makes sense. I mean, I guess is a is a person who does kind of cult, 
literary, I'm a literary scholar who works in a historical field. So uh, what's been striking to me uh, about the language of crisis in the present day is that on the one hand, you recognize that there, there, there are certain significant crises brought about by uh, mm -hmm. political decisions and forms of resource, resource control, which are leading to global warming, to the diminishment of necessary resources, things like helium, for example, uh, to the to the acidification of the oceans. And when, if, if the oceans become unsustainable for mollusks, then basically the entire ecological system collapses and we will have to find some new way to exist if we, if we exist at all. Um, so while acknowledging all these real ecological crises, uh, there's also, from a historical perspective, a sense that crisis has always been with us, that the language of crisis has always been with us, um, and that it, I think it has something to do with the way that people project their own mortality onto a larger cultural and historical field, that uh, if you look at the work I look at, the medieval work, people always believe in some ways that they're living in the end times. They always believe that they're living in a world of particular political turmoil that um and what they are experiencing of course is their own personal narrative that they have you know generally speaking between 40 to 80 years on this earth and then they die um, and they're extrapolating from that to to everything um and so from a kind of post-humanist perspective um i don't have a lot to say to that um but from a historical cultural perspective um i think the the use here is to recognize how, how often that language of crisis is used and to, um, to recognize historically what it's been used for and to recognize that it's not kind of a natural condition of what we are here in 2023, but rather something that's always been with us, which I think recognizing that I think gives us the possibility for political control of the narrative. So and that answers it in a kind of sideways way. Yeah, but, but I, I think it's very interesting that you just make me start to think of the usefulness of uh, of this end of the end of the world type of a rhetoric. If mm -hmm. it has, has always historically been there, as you pointed out in the medieval yeah. time, right? Uh, so 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 as a post-humanist scholar, do you find this kind of uh, apocalypse their, their, uh, rhetoric useful or not? I find it interesting. Um, I think what's interesting to me is that. From in the present day, in 2023, uh, a lot of the fear about the end of the world, ecological devastation, uh, social control, surveillance, uh, the the end of democracy, and so on, is in some ways for people like me, who's a, a first world, um, you know, rich democracy citizen, um, talking about things that are already happening. They're happening. They're happening in many, many parts of the world right now, where there are. Uh, these notions of basically democracy is, is disappearing, uh, uh, surveillance is increasing, ecological devastation is occurring. And so uh, the idea that the apocalypse is in the future is, I think, a, a kind of a, a notion that should be challenged by adequate political thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you think it's something that hasn't happened yet, it's very hard to resist. So that's, that's not a post-humanist answer, really. Uh, that's a more of a, a more of a political answer. Um, from a post-humanist perspective, it's again from my my kind of cultural studies. Uh, it's very inter interesting to me in the Middle Ages that there's this notion that um, the end of the world will be preceded by the fifteen signs of the last days. That there's fifteen days, and we can track day by day how the world is being systematically undone. And that on one of those days, either day four or day six, depending on which person you're reading, um, all the all the sea animals come to the surface of the ocean and they cry out in a voice. They cry out at that moment. And in these stories, um, only God understands what they're saying. No, we don't understand what they're saying. And we've, we've never heard them. And the only time we hear them is at that moment, at the last day, when they cry out in this kind of protest at their being destroyed with the world, with everything else. 
uh, it's quite unfair. They're not responsible for it, but they're they're crying out, and only God only God can understand. We can't understand them, and it's moments like that, you know, as a as a person who pays attention to animals and literature and animals historically, that uh, I'm not sure what to do with it. But it's a story that's haunted me ever since I first encountered it. That's fascinating, but also it's just a, well, I I I I probably become too talkative here, but uh, but but there's a in terms of the crisis the, between the medieval end time and the the current end time is uh, the 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 idea of the Anthropocene, right? It's an anthropogenic sort of a, a cause. I don't know yeah. if the medieval one is so so so. Of, and then we will get into a debate of where where is the starting point of the Anthropocene. So. And also who's responsible, right? People talk about the Anthropocene or, or versus the capital scene or the Plasticocene or the Thalassocene or the now fragile scene. Some people say for the like, great shipwreck. Some people say the Anthrobrocene because men are responsible. Some people talk about the Anglocene because they say the English speaking world is responsible. And, and so Gino on. Scene, somebody tried to promote, and we actually went over that last time with the rubber, yeah. <laughs> rubber yeah. structure. And, yeah. and, uh, and and also, by the way, the the the, the position that you pos the situate yourself in as a Western, you know, uh, in the first first world, uh, there's a term weird. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes, okay, yes. okay. So, so I, I, I also wonder if the post humanist study is actually more of a weird project. It, it might be, but again, you know, I, I have my particularly narrow training. So, uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I spoke or read languages outside of Europe, I have a tiny bit of Korean, but that's it, uh, then I would, I would be able to answer that question better. Yeah. Oh, all right. I should shut up. And <laughs> to, <laughs> Fun. to our, our, our question, uh, I think the next one is um, our colleague, our new colleague who is going to join us, uh, Melissa Panek. And she's actually working on uh, on. Oh, uh, Melissa, would you would you like to join us? And and then oh, let me unmute you. Sorry, I I I'm terrible with the with te technology. Um, probably I shouldn't Hi. apologize. Good morning, Hi, everyone. Hi, nice to meet you all. My name is Melissa. I'll be joining the department in August um, as a lecturer of French. So I'm really excited to join the, the project. And, you know, my research interest is looking at postmodernity post and 20th and 21st century French literature. And I've been really kind of impassioned and reignited by the whole posthumanism. And then now learning more about transhumanism, it really speaks to a lot of what I'm working on. Where So my question was, you know, related to the notion of an optimism or inherent pessimism to transhumanism. So I'm looking at, you know, thinking of some recent French novels, The Anomaly by Hervé Letelier, um, a film, Titan, where material objects that are, yeah, right, right, that are machines, ultimately take over humans. So in The Anomaly, it's artificial intelligence that photocopies and creates man. And in the film Titan, actually the machine, which is the car, it, 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 it destroys humanity. And, and I was wondering if there's this pessimism and transhumanism, or if it's more of an optimism that through the use of machines, we can better enhance humans, or if it's a fear that the cyborgs, the rise of technology will actually, you know, enslave and make humans subservient. So that that's my question to you. <laughs> sure. I, I, well, I'll talk a little bit about Titan because I, I, I love, yes. I love the movie. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, it's a story of a, of, a, of a person who is in a car wreck. Uh, her, she's got a brain injury. Her head is repaired with some kind of titanium plate. And then we see her as an adult and she's basically a, kind of a serial killer. Uh, there's something that's gone wrong with her mentally as a result of that brain injury from the car wreck. Um, and she is she falls in love with a car or a car falls in love with her or they have a they have a you know a one night stand. At any rate, she's impregnated by the car. Um, and and she there's a whole other plot that I won't go into, but essentially she uh, she gives birth to a child that is both machine and human, and uh, she dies in the process. That, that, that's kind of a spoiler. Um, but what's there's it's such a rich and complicated uh, movie that I would not recommend to everyone because it's quite violent um, and hilariously violent in places. But it doesn't really establish that when Titan, who is part metal, um, what happens when she's impregnated by the car is to a degree, it, it, it 
allows her to create this new family. It's a family, it's an artificial family so because she impersonates someone's lost child. Uh, it's an, and it's an artificial family because she has a child that's partially a car. Um, and it, so it doesn't really reestablish that boundary between machine and human, vulnerable and invulnerable, the kind of invulnerable metal plate versus the vulnerable flesh and so on, which is such a big part of that first 30 minutes of the film. But it rather kind of really, it really complicates and melds those two things. So by the end, end of the film, it, again, it feels very optimistic to me. We have this notion that the machine and the human are kind of equivalently vulnerable uh, in, this, in this new, uh, otherwise unheard of family. I think it's a beautiful movie. I, I think it's great that you're familiar with it. I think it's such a wonderful example. And actually listening to you, I kind of, I'm actually going to Germany to talk about that film. And I'm going to work on something where she's like the Madonna in metal. Because if you think about it, there's stigmata, her markings, and she gives birth to this cyborg, but she self-sacrifices. So yeah. I kind of view it as an inversion of this binary pair of man and machine and how the female rises but it was interesting to hear your perspective on post-humanism in a medieval context, because I think looking at that stigmata, the role of the Madonna mm -hmm. as the female creator who sacrificed through this is, is kind of interesting. So I appreciated you even relating post-humanism to these medieval um, mm -hmm. thoughts and practices. But I'm, I'm so thrilled you know the film. It's, it, it's... Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I've talked with, this, with some of my graduate students about it. And the, the real contrast to draw is between Titan and a Japanese film called uh, Tetsuo, the Iron Man. Uh, and Tetsuo is, is like Cronenberg's films, uh, very uh, yes. technophobic, uh, very like a notion that basically um, the machines make us violent, crueler, more, more invulnerable, less, less kind. And what Titan is so very, very interesting in comparison to the Cronenberg and comparison to Tetsuo is the way it undoes all that. Undoes thank you so that. much and body yeah. horror. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, we we have one more question. Wenxi, Wenxi, would you like to ask to Professor uh, uh, Carl Steele? Wenxi, by the way, by the way, Wenxi is a, a, a is a PhD student working on her dissertation. She's now in New York. She's she's a, a PhD student at uh, Hong Kong or is it Hong Kong Chinese Uni University, and she's here in New York at doing some research with me now. So Wenxi, please. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for Professor's exciting lectures. I'm, I'm very interested in the part that you're talking about the, the critic of the agency of non-human. So I, I'm thinking about the new material theories that because they are always uh, talking about uh, the agency of material and uh, how that we can now see body as a fixed entity and how it interacts with the wider uh, world, uh, material world. Actually, my, my dissertation is also about uh, waste. It is inspired by the waste studies and how that we should rethink this concept from a post-humanist uh, perspective. So, so I want to know more about um, from a post-humanist perspective. Uh, what's your opinion about this kind of new material perspective? Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, I talked a bit about that in regards to oysters. Um, and again, it, it seems to me that uh, a lot of the new materialist interest in agency is a kind of extension of what it believes to be human, human ability to non-human things. And so in a way, it's a kind of liberal position in the sense that it's about kind of opening up the category, uh, the dominant category to more beings without really questioning uh, the boundary itself. Um, and I can see the real value of work by, again, Jane Bennett is probably my, Jane Bennett, Levi Bryant, uh, Mel Chen. Uh, these, are, these are the people in that field that I kind of, whose work I prefer. Um, um, but again, I, I, I also want to challenge it in various ways and think about what, it, what does it mean to think of us as non-agential. And one of the things that inspired me to do that was a foundational essay on the question of agency, which I found kind of woefully unsighted in the work of uh, the new materialists back in the days when object-oriented ontology was a big deal. So in the work of people like Graham Harmon, especially, or even, even Timothy Morton. Um, and this is an essay uh, by Bronwyn Davies, 
on agency, which I think is from the late 80s or the early 90s. It's a very widely cited essay in feminist thinking. Because what Bronwyn Davies does is it, it's not agency versus passivity. It's not a binary for, for Davies. It's, a, it's, it's three categories. There's autonomy, there's passivity, and there's agency someplace in the middle. And it, I find that a lot of the new materialist thinking and they're talking about agency tend to operate with a binary. And really agency and autonomy, uh, and um, they haven't really thought about in much detail to my knowledge, uh, the distinction between the two. Um, whereas with Bronwyn Davies' essay, um, and I can I can provide a citation for that if you like if you, if you email me. Um, it's she's under she's looking at the particular political condition of women, and thinking about uh, autonomy. Of course, is, a, is is a fraudulent fantasy of being able to exist independently. It's a very masculine fantasy, and passivity um, is of course the very opposite of that. But in between that is this condition of limited potential responsibility, limited potential ability to do things and to alter things. And that to me is a, is a much more interesting place to dwell. And so for me, I think for the new materialists, I would sort of energize it with, with that kind of work and, and to see what can be done with it in that regards. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Wen Xi. And we have to move on to the next uh, question. Uh, Song, Song Maoru, would you like to uh, come up and, uh, and, uh, and ask the question? Yes, uh... Uh, uh, thanks for uh, Professor Steele's wonderful presentation. So um, I'm puzzled by some um, terms, uh, especially about the connotation of these terms, uh, because currently I just try to read some uh, research about eco-criticism and Shakespeare study. I found that many scholars try to um, give some um, uh, eco-revalue uh, ecological revaluation about Shakespeare from plant or animals, and as well as uh, some other uh, eco-critical uh, um, theories such as new materialism. So, uh, 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 in my work, I want to uh, just try to summarize uh, this part. Uh, I want to uh, uh, wait a moment. Uh, I, I, I want to ask: Is that possible to put? Uh, animal study or plant study and uh, new material studies into the material term uh, can uh, can this term can conclude all these three studies. Mm. So that's my uh, current work. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Uh, um, well, um, I don't see why not. Um, in part because it's it's already happening in, for example, Shakespeare studies. Uh, as I'm sure you know, um, there is uh, people like Ben Nardizzi at the University of British Columbia has written about kind of uh, kind of a post-humanist plant thinking and the poetry, I think, of Spencer. Uh, Steve Mentz uh, has written a lot about weather and um, in Shakespeare, uh, uh, you know, particularly around King Lear uh, and ocean. Basically, oceans are very important to him. Uh, Lowell Dukert has written a great deal about oceans and early modern thinking. So, um, and then uh, Laurie Shannon, uh, her book uh, *The Accommodated Animal*, uh, which is on uh, early early modern animal thought in in English literature. Uh, and so, I, you know, I basically I've I've been I've been at conferences with all three of these people at the same time. Which so there's a kind of material uh, evidence that that all three of these modes, new materialism, ecological thinking, and plant studies, uh, all of them uh, in various ways kind of challenge the centrality of, 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 of the human. Uh, they recognize us as entangled dependent beings uh, along with other things. And they don't erase the distinction of humans from, from everything else uh, in, in the best sort of work, but they, they do kind of challenge the notion of human autonomy. Um, and I think any, uh, this is, can happen in early modern English literature, it can happen in medieval literature, it can happen in any form of cultural thinking. So, uh, so basically I just encourage you to continue because it's, it's, it's being done and uh, it, it can be done, I think, in any cultural field. I don't know if it answers your question. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, well, thanks for um, sharing. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Um, well, so I'll just use three minutes to 
to provide my personal sort of a reflection about the last question and then perhaps urge our Chinese students, a student from Taiwan or from non-Western world to rethink about uh, this whole study of eco-criticism as a Western project or, you know, uh, as a, and, and always bring back to situate in your own cultural or, you know, historicals or, or whatever uh, uh, historical uh, period that you're, you're situated. Um, it, because I'm thinking about the whole materialist term in the West, it's a, one of the most recent ones, uh, that how do you bring it back to have a conversation with our uh, Taoist, Buddhist, or even Confucian uh, uh, traditions? How do you do, how do we do that, right? And, and wouldn't a total embrace of the Western theories you know, I believe uh, Professor Steele's project is is urging us, right, to use to think of his methodology, this his way of using his own cultural, you know, heritage, and to challenge the modern thinking. You know, so so it doesn't mean that everybody has to be a medievalist, but we have to bring the same way the spirit of a criticality, you know, to to investigate, you know, our own historical traditions. So, so how does the materialist, the Western, you know, like Jen Bennett, you know, actually a lot of them actually embrace Buddhist ideas, you know, when it comes to consciousness, the idea of the consciousness. So it's actually very interesting sort of a, you know, we are chasing a lot of Chinese students or Asian students chasing the Western theories, while the Western theories are actually looking after, you know, like studying the Eastern, Eastern, uh, uh, traditions. So, so, so I find that I find that circle or cycling is a very, very interesting ph phenomenon personally. So anyway, I'll, I won't, I won't continue forever. So I want to thank uh, Professor Carl Steele very much for giving us such a lively, well, uh, talk and also uh, discussion. And I also thank for all of you that who actually stay to the very end uh, for this last uh, lecture of our semester. And, and uh, it has been wonderful, you know, to host this talk series. And um, uh, with your support, you know, uh, colleagues and students, especially from China and Taiwan, I, I'm actually very inspired to continue to do this, you know, and uh, Hopefully Carl will join us, Robert and Melissa and, you know, Eliza, you know, all this professor and Professor Hu and Professor Song, if you're still there, you know, and Li Xing, of course, Professor Xu. And, you know, um, maybe we'll come up with something new, you know, in the future. Okay, thank you so much and uh, see you um, in the near future. Okay, bye. 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 Um, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Carl, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. I learned so much about uh, uh, this area of uh, of a scholarship that I'm I'm actually not very uh, 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 familiar with. <laughs>